Hello everybody. Well, this is the first time we've had a couple in the hot seat. And it is a massive pleasure to be talking with two very special people whom I've known since they first burst onto the Andal scene in 1988. Richard, first of all. Richard was born in South Ryslip. Those of you who know your tube map will know where that is. And was extremely fortunate to be taught trumpet at the secondary school by the principal trumpet at Sadler's Wells. He left school at 16 and joined the Junior Leaders Regiment of the Royal Armoured Corps. Not, of course, to be a soldier, but to play the trumpet, though he did give, give it a go at driving a chieftain tank. At 18, he went to the Royal College of Music, and I'll leave him to tell you about his second instrument. But the world of playing in the pit for shows soon took over his life, and he also joined the London Philharmonic. He played at Glyndebourne and, wait for it, for the Welsh National Opera production of Turandot in Cardiff, where a certain soprano caught his eye. Richard continued playing gigs on the road until he spotted an ad for Head of Brass at Arundel School. He was snapped up, of course. His energy and enthusiasm showed no bounds as he set up Arundel Brass, Rock Sock and a CCF military marching band. He inspired a number of pupils to go on to successful careers in musical theatre. Richard had also enjoyed playing in the Bardi Orchestra and the Rutland Symphonia and claims that even in lockdown he has practised every day. Did I tell you that? You did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Rita. Rita was born in Ellesmere Port uh, with a famous footballer uncle, Stanley Cullis. Her singing career started remarkably at the age of three in Grace Road Congregational Church. Later on, her teachers encouraged her to sing in Gilbert and Sullivan operettas and even a version of Carmen in a rather run-down theatre in Crewe. All this was enough for her to be accepted at the Royal Manchester College of Music, where she was taught by Sylvia Jacobs. Once out in the real world, she worked her way up through the chorus to principal roles in Turn of the Screw, Electra and, you've guessed it, Turandot at the Welsh, Welsh National Opera in Cardiff. Not many people can claim to have enjoyed the singing of the entire Welsh National Opera Chorus in the congregation at their wedding. After 11 years in Cardiff, Rita went freelance, and I'm going to enjoy asking her about her top performances at the Royal Opera House, Glyndebourne, and also in Europe. Rita has more recently been passing on her talents, teaching very fortunate people at <coughs> and at the Birmingham Conservatoire. She has enjoyed a number of significant engagements locally, including a memorable performance of Strauss's four last songs with the Rutland Symphonia. Welcome to Richard and Rita. So we're going to divide it up into uh, three episodes each so that you, they get their six records in. And we'll start off with Richard uh, on his journey from South Ryslip to meeting Rita. So my first question to Richard is, what triggered your interest in the trumpet and how on earth did you end up in the army? Um, my interest started when a, a group of um, brass musicians came to my school, a, qu um, a quartet, and I thought, well, at the time, everybody um, became engineers and I didn't particularly want to go down that route. So I actually said to my father, I'd like to join the army and especially to join an army band. Uh, so I, I just enlisted. Uh, I forget the date, 62, something like that. And I did three, three and a half, four years in the Royal Armoured Corps in their band. Um, and then I got interested in perhaps pushing on my career and going down the classical route. So my father brought me out of the army. Mm. And uh, that's when I decided to go to the Royal College of Music. OK, well, now you've got there, you've got to tell us what your second instrument was. Ah, my second instrument was singing. What? <laughs> yes! <laughs> and at the Royal College of Music, I had the, the illustrious Frederick Sharp, a marvellous bloke, and a real cockney bloke like myself. And he understood that I wasn't going to be at my singing lessons every week, Douglas, because I managed to get a job in the Festival Ballet on tour. So oh, um, I was away for... 10, 10 clean shirts, 10 weeks away. And he said, I'll see you in about two and a half months for a lesson. And he was fantastic. He used to just, 
he used to just tick me in as I've had a great lesson. We did la la la, and that was it. And and that's how I got away because you had to have a second instrument. But that's how I got away with it. <clears throat> well, that's brilliant. So when you started playing in the pits, what sort of shows were you playing in? What sort of shows? Um, well, around the around the time you know the, the late sixties, late sixties, seventies, everything was happening in the West End as it was, um, you know, before this COVID. Uh, hit everybody. I did um, the original Avita, the King and I, the Throckney Opera, Gone with the Wind, a music, the musical with Bonnie Langford was in that. Uh, Billy Lyre with uh, Michael Mike Crawford. Um, I do, I do with Rock Hudson. Now that was interesting because I took him round the pub to learn how to play darts, <laughs> and he he said he wanted to learn how to play British darts. So I took him to the pub. Uh, we walked in together. I said to the, land, the lady behind the bar, can we have two drinks? Oh, by the way, this is Rock Hudson. And she fainted on the floor. Because <laughs> at the time, uh, Macmillan and wife was on the television. And it was a very famous show with him in it. And um, so that, that, was in, that was very interesting. So that, those sort of shows, um, I, was, I was always very interested. And there was a lot of work in the West End around that time. Yeah, I bet it was. So what took you to Cardiff? Cardiff? Um, I got a job in the Welsh National Opera, second trumpet. That's handy. Yeah, and um, we did lots of, obviously that was a touring show all around Wales, uh, all the great operas, It was, it was that was a fantastic time, and that's where I met, met Rita. Very good indeed. Well, we're going to hear more about that when it's Rita's turn, but first of all, I think we need to go to our next piece. Right. Are you going to say why you've chosen it? Right, um, Marriage of Figaro, um, Marriage of Figaro is a great opera, and I think um, as a trumpet player, there's not a lot to play in these operas, but every note is every note should count. Um, and if you're feeling not very good in the morning, always put on some Mozart, and within ten minutes you should feel a lot better because it's I think it's a great music by a great composer. Well, let's give it a go. There we go. Now it's Rita's turn. Mm -hmm. how, did, how did you end up meeting Richard? So it starts off with an extraordinary story. Not only were you singing at the age of three, but somehow you you were involved with GNS and that got you to the Royal Manchester College. It just seems an unlikely route. But can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, I sang at three because I was the little girl in the choir who, when asked um, who would like to do a solo, my hand sh would shoot up. I had no fear at all. And it was at my nanny's uh, church, the Grace Road Congregational Church in Althea Port. And I started there. But when I went to school, there was a lot of GNS going on, which was in all schools at that time, a lot of GNS. And I auditioned for all that. And in, within the cast of the GNS, there were semi professionals who came from various colleges, mostly from Manchester. And um, I was encouraged by. The, the visiting singers, um, you know, you've got a lovely voice, why don't you go to college and have it trained and then you can go on to opera and, uh, you know, you, you'd have a really good career, you've got a wonderful voice. And so I listened to them to, to the extent that um, eventually I was at grammar school and I took the day off and went to Manchester and auditioned for Freddie Cox, who actually took me on the day but as it was in April, it was rather difficult because it was halfway through um, a term or whatever it was. And um, he said, well, if you come in so many weeks time, we'll, we'll start your course here. And that's, that's how I got through to the Royal Manchester College of Music. The GNS was fantastic fun. And I did so solo parts, I did choruses. I, I, I mean, it was such a, a feel good factor for me um, seeing him in GNS. And I, I really love doing it. That's terrific. So when you left the Royal Manchester College, how did yes. you kick off? What sort of work did you get? Well, I, I was at the Royal Manchester College of Music and uh, every so often um, there would be people coming to audition singers. Uh, Manchester, don't forget, in my day was a great feeder college for people going to sing solo at Covent Garden, at Welsh Oshel Opera, Scottish Opera. It was a great feeder college for people to sing um, in opera companies. And so 
this particular time, Welsh National Opera came and Glyndebourne, and uh, they both offered me a post, and I took the Welsh National Opera, and I never looked back. My first role in Welsh National Opera was um, in the chorus, actually. I did 18 months in the chorus, and they kept on giving me all these little parts and covers. And um, the first one, which was Second Boy in Magic Flute. Oh, and yeah. then it went on from there and then there. And in fact, Richard's first piece of music, when I hear the overture to The Marriage of Figaro, it slightly unnerves me because in The Marriage of Figaro, I don't know whether you realise, but the Countess doesn't come on until the second act. And so you are sitting in your dressing room, listening to everyone else getting on with it, and you're still putting your pins in your hair and your makeup on. And so you feel as though you should be doing something and everyone else is up there doing it and you're sort of sweating in the dressing room. But it's, it, it, uh, yes, that, that Mozart was my first thing I did at Welsh National Opera. I was taken out of the chorus and made a principal. That's brilliant. And at some point you ended up singing in Turandot. So tell us all well, about that. Turandot was a very special time because we, we had two Ritas in the cast. We had Rita Cullis and Rita Hunter. Now, Rita Hunter, I don't know whether people remember Rita, but I certainly do. She was the true fat lady singing. She, she, it was over when she sang. She was wonderful. She was about 24 stone, Rita was. <laughs> and she had a voice like a silvery bell. Yeah. But when she sang Turandot, it was like a train. And she was fantastic. fantastic. She was such a fabulous colleague. And um, she looked after me. She helped me with certain things. But one of the other highlights of being in Turandot, I'd sung in the chorus, obviously, to start with, and then they made me a principal. And um, as the part of you, the little scava, the, sh the, the slave, I had to um, sing that Calaf was going away, you know, and I was very upset about it. So I, I had to go, the direction was that I went to the top of a great big semicircular staircase snatch a, a knife from the belt of one of the soldiers guarding Turandot, throw the, threw it up in the air and stabbed myself. And then I had to roll all the way down <laughs> quite a few stairs, right to the front of the stage. And I had to fall in a, 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 a pose at the bottom of the stairs. And I'd overstepped it a little bit and my head was actually hanging in the pit. And I, look, I looked out of the corner of one eye and Richard was there going like that. <laughs> so that's, that's not really how we met. We'd, we'd spoken before that, but um, it was quite a funny moment. Yeah, and uh, it went on from there. You've chosen the piece that I would have thought Richard would have chosen. So tell us all. Oh, well, I was in the Beatles fan club and <laughs> I, I was going to marry every single one of them. I loved them all. John Lennon was my favourite. But in my part of the world, as they say up there, in my part of the world, the Beatles were governors, as was Jerry and the Pacemakers. And, and they used to come to our civic hall in Ellesmere Port. And so I saw Freddie and the Dreamer, Dreamers, and Johnny Kidd and the Pirates, all sorts of people. But I never actually saw the Beatles. But I did see the Rolling Stones. And I walked from Ellesmere Port to Chester, and that's seven miles, at six o'clock in the morning to clinch my my ticket and the warmer pack for the Rolling Stones was Ike and Tina Turner. Long before, you know, they were famous for the, the horrible story about her. But the Beatles, I, my, one of my English reports said that Rita would do far better if she stopped listening to the Beatles. <laughs> so I was very offended because I love them. Yeah, I love all the tunes. I know all the words. They're right good tunes though. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. So that's the story, really, Douglas. It that's excellent. Now, I hope everyone's going to try and, try and work out what the first chord is. Oh, no idea. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> they were great tunes for us, weren't they? Fantastic. They were, they were, yeah. yeah. OK, episode three, Richard's life on the road. Your turn, Richard. Tell us about your time with the London Phil. Um, well, I was just very lucky, Douglas, um, to be around uh, that orchestra. My, my um, professor who taught me the trumpet was second, second and co-principal trumpet of the London Philharmonic. And he said, would you like to come and be, be an extra player? What? So he, uh, I had to 
sort of um, work out the schedule and what they were playing. Because don't forget in those days, we just had vinyl discs to learn things. So um, I got booked and booked and booked up with, with the orchestra, play with the best, some of the best conductors around. With some of them, I didn't really, really know until someone said, do you know how famous this guy was? And I said, no, he said, they said he's very famous indeed. Anyway, it was fantastic experience. And the camaraderie I said in the orchestra, everybody helped each other. And they say, are you all right today, Richard, on that part? Da, da, da. Because it's very high powered um, work. And I enjoyed every second of it. I bet. So who were your favorite conductor? Ah, I've got a list here. <laughs> favorite conductors. Um, let me see. Um, Bernard Heiting. Well, you've had him already. Yeah. Numero uno. Klaus Tenstedt. Fantastic. Andre Previn, Daniel Baron Bayam, Adrian Bolt, Ron Goodwin in there. I, oh. I respect for, for his film music. Oh, yeah. An absolute gentleman chap. Uh, Simon Rattle, John Pritchard, Zubin Mater, Lauren Mazur. That's not a bad list, is it? That's pretty good. And you've played with all of them, obviously. I play with all those guys. And yeah. But I think if you're going to say it, my favourite of all time um, has to be Bernard, Bernard Heiting. As such a, a lovely man, a phenomenal musician, and he really looked after his players. Well, that's really good. Now, your life is about to take a complete turn because you saw an ad in the gramophone. Right. Yes, I saw this ad in the gramophone. And on the front of this, uh, the gramophone was a picture of Sean Edwards, the conductor who was conducting um, Rita's opera done in Glyndebourne, Katia Kabanova. Mm -hmm. And there was an advert inside, and the advert was about an inch and a half by two inches, head, head of brass needed for Aundel School, which is a bit of a mealy mouth advert, wasn't it? It was about an inch and a half by two. So, um, I applied for the job and, and David McMurray was there at the time, he was headmaster, okay. and um, he gave me the job in 1988. Not surprised with your CV, fantastic. And he wanted, he, he wanted, he didn't particularly want a, a teacher, he wanted a player that could teach. Yeah. And that's why, that's why he gave me the job, I suppose. Very good. Now you've chosen a really, really interesting piece next. Tell us about this. Um, well, in mm. lockdown, I've been very interested. I, I'm, I'm a big YouTuber, and I've noticed a lot of great brass playing on the Umpa band circuit, which uh, from Bavaria, and some of the some of the clarinets playing, trombone playing, tuba playing, especially the trumpet players are all on rotary trumpets, as you'll see in this clip. And this is the I think the, the smartest um, uh, Umpa band you'll ever see in your life because they are. A section of the Vienna Philharmonic. Just have a listen. Wow. <laughs> what do you think? Good? It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that. It doesn't get any better than that. Oh, that's real I mean, quality. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Well, on we go to Rito again now. Your international career takes off, and, and as it does so, you have to start learning roles. Now, you know, in my time, I've learned lots of piano pieces, and I can sort of understand that that's a, that's a doable thing, but you had to learn not only the notes, but the location, the art, the way you're going to stand on the stage, and all the entries. You've got to learn everybody else's part as well. What, what a challenge. How on earth did you cope? Well, you cope by tedious repetition. Um, oh. As far as the music is concerned, it's just repetition, repetition with the texts. And don't forget, a lot of the music I used to do was in another language. I've oh, yeah. Russian, Czech, German, Italian. Um, ooh, what else? I can't think. But anyway, uh, it was a, a multifaceted um, task to do. But you had to, you had to really. Um, try very very hard to run the two t the, the the all facets together and i learned this from a man called stuart burrows stuart was a wonderful tenor and he's still alive i, I don't know how old he's he is but he taught me the ethic of of making a working day 
out of the things I had to learn. Bearing in mind that when you start singing Wagner or you sing the big, um, the Tchaikovsky's or even the English repertoire, things like Peter Grimes, there's a lot of learning and you have to schedule a working day. I had to schedule a working day for myself. Otherwise, I'd just be floundering around, oh, I'll perhaps I'll learn that bit today and that bit tomorrow. I had a te um, 10 to 1, 2 to 5 working day, flat out with my piano, and you just say to yourself, how many pages are there? Right, there's 250 pages, I've got 175 days to do it. So you, the way I used to do it is I counted all that up and said, on every day for that week, I have to learn off the book so many pages. And it sounds very um, robotic, but in actual fact, um, it, it, it stood me in good stead. And of course, I used to learn on the train with earphones on. I'd be singing at Covent Garden doing the ring cycle, ring cycle, and then I'd be doing Peter Grimes in my other ear. And it was just an ongoing learning process. There is no quick fix being a, a musician or even a singer. <laughs> I can imagine. Now, we, we've heard about uh, Richard's favourite conductors. Yes. Would you like to tell us about your favourite agents now that you're freelance? Um, do you know, my mind has just gone very blank. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I did have to have agents when I was um, freelance. Um, when I was at Welsh National Opera, I was very well looked after. And I've had several agents all over the world, mostly in London, I have to say. Um, and then I started to do quite a lot of work in Holland and in Amsterdam. And there was a, a, an agent in um, Amsterdam called Peter Alfrink. And he'd heard me singing the Wagner at the Concertgebouw in, in Amsterdam. And he took me on. And I was with one of his young, um, new agents, um, what was his name? Teo. Teo. Yeah. And Teo looked after me really, really well and got me lots of lovely work. And so that widened my horizons because of being in Holland. The Germany came along to listen to when I was singing there. And all sorts of other agents and other companies came to Holland as opposed to coming to London with a different catchment area. But mm. um, I had a lot of very good agents, uh, some not so good, some a little bit difficult, but no, mainly they were good, good agents. I thought there was one particularly difficult one. Oh, I'm, I couldn't possibly tell you that, Douglas. Yes, she tr <laughs> he, he or she tried to get you a part in Billy Budd. <laughs> ah. She was an assistant to the agent. Yes, yeah, she said to me one day, um, all the time agents are desperately find, trying to find singers' work, and it's not it's not easy. Uh, you know, um, it, it, it comes in, in waves. You know, one year you'll have loads and loads of work end to end, and the next year there'll be nothing at all. And so Victoria said to me, now, Rita, I've got some things to ask you. Do, do you know these roles? Now then, it's blah, 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 blah. Oh, and there's another one. Is there anything in Billy Budd for you? And I said, well, I don't No, I don't think so. And unless I'm going to be the, um, what do you call that woman on the front of the ship? <laughs> you know, I'll call her take me as a galleon. But I said, unless I'm playing that part, there is absolutely nothing in Billy Budd for me. There's no and there's no women in it. So that's <laughs> she really shot herself in the foot. And she, of... she was a good agent, actually. Yeah. She was a good assistant agent. She, yeah. she said all the right things. OK, can you just tell us about your high, high spot at the Royal Opera House? You must have a, a particularly strong memory. Do you know, the high spot for me was walking through the door. Mm. You were made to feel as though you were Maria Callas walking in the door. The stage manager greeted me there, Stella, Ch Stella Chitty, yeah. and she said, good morning, Rita, I'll show you to your dressing room. And I thought, oh my God, I'm in, I'm in Covent Garden and someone's showing me to my dressing room. But uh, Covent Garden was a very, very special place. And still is. And still is. And mm. I've got lots of highlights there. I did the Vixen there. But the main, um, the main thing were, were, were two ring cycles with Richard Jones and with Bernard Hiting. And Bernard, we both love Bernard. Really We've it. done a lot of work with him. And um, but a great party at his house. Yeah. <laughs> and we, I mean, the, the ring cycle was just fascinating. And although I never dreamt in a million years that I would become a Wagnerian, 
I started off with Second Boy and then Pamina and then The Countess and then a bit of Tchaikovsky and a bit of English opera. And then suddenly they were saying, how about Zieglinda? Would you like to sing that? And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what, what a huge leap. But they look after you, they, you're well rehearsed, you learn your pieces, you learn your, your arias, your quartets, whatever that you've got. And then they do the direction with you. And of course you say, when I walk to that chair, I am singing that. And when I walk to that cupboard, I am singing that. And that helps with the learning process. But to work at Covent Garden, it is a very special place as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Now, you've got to tell us why you chose this lovely piece. Mainly because I, I just love it. it, it what, what, is, what is the next one? The clarinet? Yeah. Is it? Yes. Yeah. The uh, Mozart. Yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, it's Mozart. And it's just lovely. And I, I heard someone say this the other day, and I thought, oh, that's a bit maudlin. But um, they said about, not about this piece of music, but um, they were playing a piece of music, and they said, this is the, this is the last piece of music I want to hear when I'm, I'm dying. Oh. <laughs> I thought, oh. No, I don't find it. I don't find it morose, really. I find it uplifting and, and comforting and relaxing. I just, I just love it. And a great okay. play. Here we go. Yeah, we have to turn it off. But Rita, you had a little thought on that. Yes, just that it's Jack Brimer playing, oh, oh, and yes. his wife, the Duchess, she of purple hair, were two of the most lovely people. And um, I, I was fortunate enough to sing with him on a couple of occasions. But uh, he was just such a lovely man, and and his wife, and, and they made us feel very comfortable with them. Best recording. A beautiful recording of it. Mm. Okay, back to Richard now. Right. Episode five. Richard shakes up Andor School. So oh. let's see. Well, Richard, you were snapped up and no surprise there. Uh, tell us about your first initiative, which, if I, if I recall, was Rock Sock, which I don't suppose as any other school in the country had anything like it. Well, um, David McMurray, who was the uh, headmaster at the time when I came, when we came in '88. Um, there's always been big rock music in the school, but not very organized. And and I came along and I used my skills of hiring the best sound companies in around the area. Uh, we really, really organized it. They, we had usually two or three nights, no, four nights of, of rock music every term, which gave the bands who worked very, very hard uh, to perform. Um, and it gave them an insight and, and an energy to get up in front of their peers and play the music that they like to play. I, I, I gave, guided them a lot because some of the, at the time when, I, when, we, when we came there, um, garage and grunge music was on, was on the menu. And I thought, nah, let's really get down to the basics of rock. So we had some phenomenal rock bands. And we used to just <laughs> um, trash the hall every, every <laughs> um, term, basically. And <laughs> we didn't. But we had, we had for the senior, for the senior uh, band night, uh, we, had, we had a bar on as well, everything like, you know, um, and David and Murray at the time, we had motorcyclists going across the Great Hall, up onto the stage on Harley Davidson's, and the headmaster <laughs> used to stand there and shake his head. Uh, but he said he didn't want to stop it because the energy that the children and the pupils showed was fantastic. That's really good. Thank you for that. Um, now, you also founded Anvil Brass, and they actually played at my son's wedding. Uh, I know a great group. And the CCF Marching Band. Any thoughts on those? The C CCF Marching Band was the, uh, the last year, kind of the last year of my tenure at the school. Um, and the pageant master was an ex Aldelian. I forget his name now. He's a Bramstonian man. Mm -hmm. um, and he, uh, we had, uh, they said, well, would you like to form the band to, to try and play in the Lord Mayor's show, which is November the 10th every year, I think. And we, we worked. I went around all the army barracks, borrowed uniforms. We had a 60-piece marching, no, 70-piece marching band, plus a pipe, a pipe squad, um, pipers. And we worked and worked and worked. We had a drill master. I organized all the marching um, and the organization of that. And it was a tremendous success. And we were uh, in the rehearsal side of things. We, were, we thought 
we had it taped until we actually got to the day and we're all lined up you know first first trip to london the band started off it sounded fantastic but the one thing we didn't actually um visualize were in london there were sort of things in the middle of the road bollards, bollards in the middle of, we never practiced that there were bollards in the middle of the road so i just shouted out um five to the left five to the right the band split no problem joined up that was it and that, that was all i said that sounded all at its very best oh very good i'm sure you've got lots of happy memories of andal but oh. now I, I guess you're retired from that so dare i ask how do bardi and rutland symphonia compare well, oh, I'm going to carefully. Woo! Fighting talk. <laughs> talk there. Um, I, I actually love both of those orchestras. I think Klaus does a, a, a great job for the Bardi, and Paul does a fantastic job at the Rutland. And I Just enjoy. Be careful. It. Yeah, no, but what I'm saying is that I enjoy both, both the events. Uh, I, I enjoy working with Paul and Rachel, and I enjoy working with the with the Bardi boys, Clive Bailey and those sort of people. And um, they, they're in their own sections, they are fantastic. They are two different, slightly different setups, but very good standard of music. Well, that's really good. Now, I do believe you've got something quite special for your final item. Right. Um, this is what I saw this recently. Um, this is John Williams conducting my favourite orchestra, the Vienna Philharmonic, <laughs> in the in the Star Wars, the, what was the piece called? The uh, Imperial yeah, March. Much. Now, I like to kind of dedicate this to Robert and David Kahlo, because we, we we play quite a lot of this music, and we all love it. And what's it? What's interesting about this this clip is that the, is for, is it the music of Verein in, in Vienna, and the the crowd go ballistic because it's unannounced that they're going to play this piece. It's not on the program. It's John Williams, and it's John conducting. and it's John Williams conducting. Just have a look. Oh, that's brilliant! Okay, now it's Rita's swan song. Oh. Oh. More singing and charity events. Um, I, I, I forgot to say in the previous thing that I actually heard you singing this amazing opera, King Lear, in Amsterdam, because I was over there yes. at a conference. Yes. And it struck me that that must have been a whopping challenge to learn, because it was all modern music. That, that was absolutely horrendous. I felt like I lost my voice every time I sang it. Um, to give you an idea to people that don't know the piece, it was by Aribert Ryman. He was a very genteel, very nice man. Always bought me a drink. He liked me because I had a little drink with him. And his music was uh, extraordinary music because it involved so much. You heard a lot of percussion on the last piece, but he had his percussion, percussion on stage, yeah. 20. But it wasn't just a little drum going or, or a little tiny tambourine. There were huge tam-tams. There were great big... Uh, bass yeah. drums, everything, yeah. ethnic instruments. Kitchen, kitchen sink. Ki yes, the kitchen sink, <laughs> as Richard says. And it was apt when you were on stage trying to sing, the orchestra were in the pit, and that was with a man called Hartmut Henschen, and that was, it began at the Netherlands Opera, and then we went to East Germany, what was East Germany, to um, Leipzig. Leipzig and Berlin, Dresden. And they, the, the, it was just a massive, massive piece. And there was one part of it I had to stand up on the top of a table. Well, when I tell you that the table was huge, so it made me look like a little person, oh. you can see how that was. It wasn't just the singing of it, it was the physicality of it. Yeah. The story of Leah, of course, is very hard, hard story and very... Uh, oh, really over dramatic for singers really but it was just uh, so exhausting every night and I, it was sold out and when it first started it was very poorly sold and there were one or two bo booths in the audience on the first night then it went to press the next performance they were really strangling one another to give get, them, ticket. get tickets huh. it was such a success but gosh that was hard work I, yeah, well, I got one 
You yes, said, you got a ticket, didn't and, you? And you were on time, Douglas. Jeez. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> Douglas, you never paid me for that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I am, of course, a, a, a fully paid up member of your fan club because I also, another highlight for me was sitting four rows in front of you singing Verdi's Requiem in the Arundel School Chapel. I mean, that Requiem is basically a concerto for soprano, isn't it? Well, but do you have any yeah. Verdi memories? Oh, lots of Verdi memories, lots and lots of them. I've sung it in, in all sorts of places. You've changed in broom cupboards. Yes, I've changed in broom cupboards for the Verdi Requiem. I oh. did a Verdi Requiem in the um, oh, Brompton Oratory. Right. And we, 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 as women, the, uh, the first soprano and the mezzo, we weren't allowed into the rest of the building, being Catholic and all that. And it was for one of the... I can't remember her name. It's not Clarissa. It's the other one of the two fat ladies. Yeah. And she and she died. And she asked for the Verdi Requiem. And um, we we were we were miles away in a, in a it was in a, in a bread bread cupboard. And there were all bread baskets, and we were getting <laughs> into our clothes, trying to get dressed with all these things going on. And um, the girl I was singing with, no names, no pack drill. Um, she had been a pop singer. And um, we got to the annual stay, which, as you probably know, starts unaccompanied and out, you know, just out pitch out of midair, singing in octaves. And I said to David, who was conducting, David Hill, it was, I said, David, tell everybody to keep really still at that moment, because if anyone pushes a chair, it's going to make a pitch on the floor and, mm -hmm. you know, it might not start in the right octave. And I said to David, don't don't move, don't do anything. And at the end of the, I think it's the Sanctus beforehand. That's it, and it. he indica indicated to the chorus to sit down with, I don't know whether you can see me doing this, but he, he said, sit down to the chorus. And the mezzo, who'd never sung it before, a little bit in inexperienced, she came in with her line on the wrong pitch. And she oh. started going, oh, no. And we were, we nearly died. We nearly died. And everybody was shaking and their then, heads. And everyone was going, no, no. 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 <laughs> but the Sphinx of Verdi Requiem is fabulous, especially when the trumpets come in, of course. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Get the trumpets. <laughs> but, yes, I've also, was... also come across you quite a bit because you've done a lot of charity work for Mary Curie, some opera evenings. Yes, yes. Now, I had a great time with your dear wife, Margaret. Um, mm -hmm. And various various other people having meetings and you know and, and, and organising it. But yes, I, I felt that was a rather a good charity um, for us to do. And I had three willing colleagues, well four willing, willing colleagues. I had a pianist, I had Graham Danby and his wife um, Val, and I had a, a young chap called John Hudson, who was always good for a laugh. And and we used to sing concerts and we used to have a, a format and usually the, the the final songs a song we used to sing was we'll gather lilacs in the spring again <laughs> and of course that's a world war two song and um they we used to be together john and i would be together he would stand behind me and val and, and graham husband and wife would stand on the other side of the stage we'd get the introduction and john used to whisper in my ear um what did what did we used to say? He used to say in a lady's voice, "Will there be a war, Daddy?" Yes, and it's going to be beastly. <laughs> so that so when I had to come in, I was so choked I couldn't <laughs> sing it. And that happened, and All I don't know whether Margaret realizes this. Which is lovely. But we laughed so much, but we enjoyed it. And when we when the money started coming in for the charity, that was the best reward. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. And we were looked after by Margaret and her team. It was great. It was really lovely. Fantastic. Well, we've really enjoyed uh, knowing you since 1988. It's been an absolute pleasure. We've oh, got your final choice. Before it comes, I just want to remind everybody, if you have a question for our two lovely guests, do stick them into chat. Or in a minute, we're going to open it up and you can just uh, shout out your question. But finally, we've got the most sumptuous, gorgeous recording of uh, Richard Strauss. So uh, Rita, tell us about this, this recording. This is a recording that was done in um, a, a, a concert to mark the, was it the tw uh, 25th um, anniversary, a birthday of Opera North. Am I right in that? Is it 25th? 21st, it says here. 21st, 21st yes. Yeah. 
And in, <laughs> and I was involved in um, what was the other piece I was in? I forget what it was now. But one of my pieces I was involved with was the trio from Rosen Cavalier, and um, it was a piece I'd done at Welsh National Opera, um, and done it with really other other starry people like myself. Um, no other people, and um, and I, I I so enjoyed it, and it was another it was another oh what Fine. string to my bow really because I'd done the Wagner's, I'd done the Mozart's, I'd done the Tchaikovsky's, the Benjamin Benjamin Britten for miles, but then we came to Rosen Cavalier, and I I'd been involved with Strauss with Harry Kupfer doing a very famous elect Electra Welsh National Opera. But when I heard the music of Rose and Cavalier, there was actually one line in Rose and Cavalier that I couldn't sing because I was crying. It was just so heartfelt. And they did this trio in this um, birthday concert at Opera North. And I've never forgotten it. It's, it's just such beautiful music. It's fabulous. Here we go. Oh. I bet they brought a lump to your throat. <laughs> oh, all the time. Yeah. I, I, I actually sing one line after that, and, and I, I just couldn't sing it. It was just amazing. Mm. Yeah, very, very emotional. Mm. Yeah. Good. Well, we, we've gone on the journey now. We've got you both here. We now know where you met and uh, or a lot about your careers. So the time now is to take you back to Gallery View, put right. your video on. And unmute your microphones, and off we go. That's right, muted. Is it? Yeah. Good evening, oh. Rita and Richard. So it's Hello. Here. Hello. I'm going to be dealing with the questions. Okay. Um, so we've got a question from Sue, and she it's to Rita, and she says, uh, "Do you speak any other languages as well as being able to sing them?" No, I tend to learn them phonetically, but inevitably, when you've worked on a piece for so long, um, you get to know words and you can piece them together. I, I, you know, I can ask for a cup of coffee in German, <laughs> but when you're working on a piece, obviously, I, um, <laughs> the, the type of German that I would be saying, I couldn't have a conversation with this. So, um, you know, it's, I don't think, speak a language, but I know a lot of it. Oh. Thank you. Um, so Rachel's asked about three questions, so I'll perhaps do hers again. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, more, like, more like about ten, but I, I, could, um, I can ask Richard any time, and he tells me stories all the time. But um, a couple of questions. I, I guess one of them's for one of them's for both of you, which is I'm sure over the years you've had a little black book of contacts, and I wondered who each of you like the most famous person you had in your little black book was at any given period in time. Oh gosh, who did you have in your little black book? My little book. black book. I mean, someone famous, someone famous, maybe. Yeah, someone famous, not just me or Robert or David or Paul. <laughs> Somebody you know, famous, famous. Well, um, well, I had, I was very friendly with Bonnie Langford. You know Bonnie? Because mm -hmm. I, I did Peter Pan with the musical with her, and she's such a fantastic working lady. I mean, everything she does is full on, and uh, and her um, stagecraft and the way she goes about her life. She's a, she's a fan, she's a top top lady. What about you, Rita? Um, well, I know a lot of people. Whether they're in my address book um, uh, yes i mean Bryn turvel is a very good pal of ours yeah. very good pal and uh, thomas allen willard white uh, there's loads of people that i'm in touch with still um but Bryn turvel is a really good friend i suppose he's the most starry in my book yeah and this is a question for richard and i probably crosses over with someone else's but how many composers' music do you think you have played and actually known the composer as well? Oh, oh not many, not too many, um, and known the composer as well. As personally, like, personally, yeah. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I don't. Um, not Rachel. That's a very tricky question because I, I, I didn't do it. If I was going to do the composer as well, that would that would uh, consist of modern music. 
Um, and the answer to that is they're all dead. I kissed Sir Michael Tippett. Oh. <laughs> I, I kissed Sir Michael Tippett. <laughs> He was a nice man. He was on the stage. <laughs> I, I, I'll, 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 go, Sarah. I'll, go, I'll go to bed on that question. Think, is there anybody that I know that's a composer that is alive now, maybe? Or I I know our new person. He'll let you know. I'll let Just you. Don't, don't message me at two o'clock in the morning and let me know, though, will you? Really? <laughs> <laughs> say, remember, remember when we could kiss people we didn't actually live with. But anyway. Oh, <laughs> yes, cool. Uh, um, so Robert had a question about outfits, Rita. Um, yes. Have you ever worn any outfits um, which have actually interrupted or interfered with your singing? <laughs> well, it, it's, it's strange. A lot of the outfits I've worn for singing have been um, corseted, uh, you know, really tight corsets like, you know, the Victorians wore. And in actual fact, um, they're rather good to sing in because when you take that huge breath in to do a massive big phrase you sort of push against them uh, i wouldn't say i've ever worn a costume mind you i did wear a costume in garsington i was doing i was doing a lecture in idomeneo and the the chap the designer put me in a copper pink silk skirt and bustier with DMs, the biggest DMs you've ever seen, and I'm a size eight. And so I was clomping about. I suppose that was the most uncomfortable. Yeah, but generally, um, being a soloist, being the main the main thing, sure um, they, they give me, they measure me well, and if I put weight on, they take it out, and if I put loose weight, they take it in. They're always, you know, doing, um, shoes were, were always an issue for me because I've got size eight feet. And I remember doing the composer in Ariadne Avnaxos at ENO. And I'd walked around the stage in trainers for weeks and weeks. And I said, well, in order to um, do this, what we call a trouser roll, I really need the shoes to make me walk like a young man, not flat footed, but lifted in a, in a Louis heel. And so we were, we were in, where were we? We were in Oundel at the time. And this man was bringing my shoes from uh, London from Anello and David to Up our on house motorbike. on a motorbike to a, a courier to let me work with them for the weekend because right. the, uh, the following week it was the yeah. first night and we could hear this motorbike going round and he obviously morning. couldn't hear, find us so at three o'clock in the morning this guy he walked in our house with you know absolutely black on the road <laughs> and I sat him down gave him a cup of tea and he brought my shoes but um, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever had a, a, a difficult costume. Not, not, not really. Bad. You get used to it. Yeah. And then from, from David, uh, this is to Richard. Um, what was Ron Goodwin like to be with and to play for? Oh. Ron, um, as you know, I managed him for a few years. Um, is another thing I, like, thing I, I like to do. Um, he was a fantastic joke. He was always joking. He, he was a very kind man, a great, great musician. And he was he was very serious about his music because he cared about it. But the funny side of him was brilliant and he was great, great fun to be with. And I, I had some great times with him and he was very, very kind and complimentary to all the orchestras he worked with. Mm. Everybody loved him. Mm. Yeah, he was a great bloke. Mm. Yeah. yeah. One other bit, what, what big soundtracks have you played on? I'll tell you a, a story about a soundtrack and the London, uh, the London Symphony were rehearsing Star Wars. Mm. Uh, the track was behind them. It was the, the original 1973, was it? 72, 73? 77. Was it 70, the, the, first, the very first one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, they're playing away, whatever the first bit was, where, where the, the credits are rolling up like that. And he turned to his mate and he said, do you think this a take off? <laughs> well, no, I think Rock we're all hugely appreciative of, of our guests tonight. It's been fascinating. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Yeah. See you soon. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.